good evening everyone we will now be starting with our research proposal writing workshop writing a dissertation thesis is a pertinent part of every course at tis hence the students meet 2021 decided to conduct a workshop on writing a research proposal the workshop will be facilitated by ms ekta singla a little about ms ekta singla uh, ekta is a third year doctoral student at the center of excellence in teacher education uh, at tis her research is exploring the potential of figurative expressions among hindi speaking multilingual children to express and organize their their world she is also a fulbright nehru doctoral fellow for 2021 to 2022 in the last two years along with her doctoral work she also worked with tata trust faculty at tis and teachers from mahatma gandhi international school ahmedabad to develop an online course on experiential learning from cbsc school teachers um uh, as a student she has been part of many student led initiatives as well for example student meet 20, 2019 student meet 2020 and riaz the magazine to know more about her work we'll be sharing her blog in the chat i think we are good to go ekta if you can start yeah all the best sure thanks we both for that very generous introduction um thanks first of all for the opportunity to uh, you know sort of cumulate all the knowledge that i have gathered over a um, few years especially from my teachers and uh, mentioning teachers i do want to acknowledge um, different teachers who sort of helped me understand research proposal particularly over the years um and i mean this might encourage you but uh, uh, when you start working on a research proposal there is um you know when you write the first time you might understand one part of a research proposal very well but others are sort of not not things that you get right for the first time um but over i mean it's about working on it continuously and uh, over over a period of time then you start uh, understanding different sections better and um you know how they connect with each other so i would say that don't try to understand everything in one go um something like this takes time and just be patient with yourself um, i can tell you from my own experience that i failed multiple times and only learned um, after years of just being in there and consistently uh, working on it um you please do excuse my dog he uh, he just roams around the house and he's you're going to keep hearing him um and un unless it's very uh, you know problematic uh, i mean this is how it's going to be uh, just message me if it's too disturbing so some of the teachers i've mentioned on the slide are people from uh, different institutions and organizations i've been part of um uh, that is anveshi research center at uh, hyderabad uh, people there and especially my mentor there uh, shrivatsan uh, my professor at uh, institute of london uh, where i did my mphil professor judith swiza and currently my supervisors uh, padma sarangapani and nishweta jendra and uh, lastly of course rakesh sen gupta who's a professor here at sri university so these are the people who um some of them i'm understanding and learning from now but others i've learned uh, over a period of time so what are we going to cover today is uh, how do ideas that you put together in a research proposal um you know what is the power of the ideas what is exactly that you're doing in a research proposal um, and why is it so difficult sometimes to put these ideas and formulate these ideas in a research proposal uh, second we'll also look at who is your audience when you're writing a research proposal what is the purpose of this writing uh, developing a research question uh, in itself is a huge huge task uh, and what are the ways that you can uh, sort of deal with this uh, question a little better uh, what is the significance of structure in the research proposal so uh, what are the different sections how do they come together and uh, how do they actually make a significant argument that you're trying to make uh, what does each element of the structure mean so for example what is a theoretical framework what are the epistemological or ontological questions what do they even mean and how do they influence your methodology for example we will look at some of those uh, parts uh, in between throughout when we look at these different sections i will hopefully also pause and reflect uh, in case you want to do it uh, if there are parts when i'm um, talking about that uh, are elusive or they are uh, i'm not being able to convey it to you or you are not able to uh, get a gist of that idea please do pause and just let me know just Uh, switch on your mic and just shout out let's let's keep it as informal as possible uh, questions uh, you can ask at any point but lastly if there are any further questions we'll take them up as well um i haven't mentioned it here but throughout this presentation there are different resources 
uh, which are useful to put together a research proposal. At least these are resources I have used uh, over the years. And uh, I mean, you don't have to take them down. I can just share this people with you uh, through the organizers later. So, yeah. Um, so uh, this is one of my uh, favorite comic novels and this is V for Vendetta. I don't know how many of you have uh, watched the movie or uh, read the uh, comics, uh, but uh, this is very powerful in terms of, uh, it tells you about the power of ideas and it's about a dystopian world where one man's quest for freedom means bringing people together uh, by showing them their own failure to protect freedom, inspiring them with ideas and provoking them to overthrow the current state or the current regime. Um, and he says something very interesting that has stayed with me over the um, over many years. And I keep going back to this book again and again. He says that, remember the idea, not the man, because a man can fail, he can be caught, he can be killed and forgotten. But 100, 100 years later, an idea can still change the world. So I would say that we are all in the business of making ideas. And um, it is important to understand the power that these ideas hold, not just for others, but for yourself as well. If you are able to sort of uh, formulate an idea in a research proposal that changes your worldview, um, you have the power then to convey that idea to others. Um, and don't ever underestimate that power because the world is how we see them. The world is how, uh, you know, how we see the structures around it, how we see the interconnections between them. And that is all our day-to-day -day life is. Uh, we all, since we all see the world differently, our ideas of the world are different. We also live our lives differently. And there is no bigger power than an idea then. There's another line which he says is that words offer the means to meaning. And for those who will listen, the enunciation of truth. So the ideas are very uh, close to us. They're important to us because they form our very life and the way we live it. So there's nothing more important than the meaning that these words hold. And they are the enunciation of truth, as he says, for many of us who believe in it. Yeah, um, sorry to interrupt. Abhinav has his hand raised if you can take his question. Yeah, Abhinav. Look, yeah, I'm just saying that the idea is bulletproof. This is yes, a famous yes, 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 yes. for Vendetta. Yeah. Yes. Um, also, I think many people are a big fan of uh, V for Vendetta. Okay, sure. I'm glad. And um, this must be common to some of you, like at least people who know about this novel, that where does this mask come from? There's a whole uh, symbolic meaning to the mask itself that V wears throughout the movie. Anybody would care to share? Yeah, the guy Fox, uh, you know, blowing up the... Uh, he tried to blow up the British Parliament on the 5th of November. Right. Uh, I forget the year of it. Yeah. Right. It's, an, it's 1600s or something. Um, and uh, this is so basically uh, this is the reason why he says that remember the idea not the man because uh, he's using the face of a man whose uh, name or uh, even the person that he was is lost in history uh, but the very idea of him uh, going against the regime or you know saying something that others did not believe in uh, and the very idea of blowing up the parliament for what he believed in um, there was a whole war between religious sects around that time, which was he was trying to uh, sort of, uh, you know, make his point. And so uh, that's why he says that people are going to forget who said what. Even now, a lot of the things that we do, we don't really remember who said what a lot of times, but uh, we remember the ideas overall. We don't remember the people who brought them to us. So uh, when, um, when we're putting together the research proposal, we all come to this, um, uh, you know, working this research proposal through some thoughts that we formulated either through our life or something that has inspired us. But they are still thoughts that are fragmentary. Uh, they are disconnected holes uh, that we are trying to sort of make sense of uh, in this institution that we find ourselves now. They're also foggy at times. Uh, you can't see them clearly. You see the connection somehow, but you don't really know what they actually mean. Um, and the kind of things you can do with them. So they're also very elusive at times. They're difficult to formulate, they're difficult to archive or even achieve. And uh, um, I, I should tell you that this is a very interesting place to be in, to not know what you're actually thinking because what happens then is you can do creative things with it. You're not so, you're not so uh, fixed with your idea. You don't really know what is in your mind and you're still trying to formulate it. So it's, a, it's almost like a creative act it's a creative act that you're going to do with your research proposal. Something probably for some of you that has never been said 
or never been written about. So uh, it's a very interesting place to be in. So um, one thing for sure that it's a challenge, no doubt. But the other thing is that you're doing, a, you're almost uh, performing a creative act, uh, something that you should, you know, feel uh, proud about as well as uh, something that should inspire you, I would say. And how do these fragmentary, elusive, uh, you know, thoughts become ideas and they find your place in research proposal is something that we're going to look at today. But before that, uh, we're also going to see that what does it take uh, for these uh, fragmentary thoughts to become uh, part of your research proposal? You know, I, um, I do say that uh, to some of my friends and others as well that uh, it never comes in a day. It takes its time uh, and you have to give yourself time. And time in the sense that you can't just sit in one day and write a research proposal or even a week. Sometimes uh, the problems that you take up uh, they will only find themselves in the research proposal if you are patient with yourself, if you read through consistently, you give yourself time and uh, you're trying to, you're trying to think through your writing. So the idea of writing itself is like a thinking act. When you put something in words, it may not appear the way that you've thought it. So what you do, you, you know, you redo it, you edit it, you write it again and again and again, unless you find the words that actually you want to convey. So it's going to take time. Also, it's going to take a lot of alone time where you're not distracted with other things like my dog or you know the phone and other people. Uh, so uh, a lot of those things are going to be important. It also is going to require conversations with people. Sometimes uh, when you talk to people around you, they give you a sense of looking at things differently that you probably haven't thought about. And these are people like your supervisor, your peers, people who are around you who have probably have done this uh, many more times than you. And sometimes they help you, um, you know, bring together something that is just hanging um, through a thread in your mind. Also, it's important to uh, reflect on your own thinking. What is exactly that you're trying to, because sometimes we tend to get stuck in a thought. Uh, it almost becomes a circular thing. That's something that you don't know what to do with, something you don't know how to come out of it. Or uh, So these are all things that are going to be challenges and it's okay. One thing is that everybody goes through it. So it's not something new. Uh, I'm just going to take a pause at the moment if there are any questions or anything that you disagree with or anything that you want to express, feel free. Yeah, so uh, I had uh, a similar thoughts as well, as in how do you exactly, there are a lot of times that uh, I personally feel while writing, uh, I uh, come across a lot of creative blocks, as in, uh, I don't know, these are just, it just happens as in uh, you're writing and then you suddenly experience a block and then you're unable to continue what you're writing. Right. So how do we actually deal with such um, blocks? I mean, am I making sense? Yeah, 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 sure, sure, you are. Um, I personally feel that a lot of times when I experience block, um, and this has happened to me a couple of times, one of the things I feel is that there is a gap in my knowledge on that particular topic. So if I'm writing a sentence uh, and which I think I've understood, I then I start writing, you know, in the document that I've made a word document, I read something and I think, okay, I've understood I'm going to write. Um, and one of the reasons for that block is that uh, I really haven't grasped that concept very well. And so I need to reread some of those sections again and then come back and write it in my own words from what I've understood. Um, it is hard to see that, uh, you know, at first, but given that these are academic texts, which are um, written in a language that is not very easily accessible a lot of times. And for, I mean, including myself, English is not my first language. Um, so the structure of the sentences, the words sometimes are very difficult to grasp in the way that they have been uh, presented to us. Uh, so one of the best things to do is just take a pause, just reread the thing again. Uh, in, it could take a couple of more readings and then come back and write it. Um, that is that is one reason for the block sometimes. Uh, the other thing is that uh, many a times that uh, uh, is just that you know the 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 way you form sentences sometimes uh, they don't really connect with what you actually want to say. So it might be that linguistically the structure of the sentence needs to be changed or redone. It's almost like a drawing, like you're drawing something and you see a line going here and there which you didn't actually want to intend. So you erase that drawing and you make that structure again. So. Linguistically, also sometimes our languages, because English is not our first language again, they tend to uh, block our thoughts sometimes. 
I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. I think Lokesh had his hand up some time back. Uh, he kind of uh, put it down, so I don't know if he still has it. Yeah, Lokesh, go ahead. Sorry, I had. Ah, uh, so what do you mean by thoughts? Like there have been multiple thoughts are coming. Like I also have given some serious time for to. you know identify some problem that i really want to address it in a long term you know like before even deciding that i will go to masters and then i'll do my thesis and then i'll think of post doctors everything but uh, what do you like how do you like uh, fine tune that idea or uh, or or uh, you know that's where i am also stuck i mean, i mean you can you can also or share what you had done or whatever you have practiced you know that's sure. what my query was yeah no you're right i mean there are multiple thoughts uh, i mean i have thought what is going to be for dinner what my dog is going to do i hope he doesn't bite me while i'm presenting yeah we all have multiple thoughts uh, so one of the things is to block distractions multiple thoughts uh, when i what i meant by thoughts is particularly uh, in relation to your uh, research questions or the idea of the concept that you want to pursue in terms of your research for example um, if education i'm guessing most people here are from beard and uh, their field is education so there are multiple strands that you can pursue with education and these could be um, gender related uh, differences in terms of education or it could be literacy or it could be uh, i don't know mathematics particularly science education so there are multiple strands you can take when you're writing a research proposal um and uh, to bring the, from this broader idea to this narrow singular idea of research that you want to do uh, is something that takes time and patience um and that is what we are going to discuss further on um i think we are just 20 minutes into our discussion as of now um i don't want to uh, give give off like the secret as of now so that yeah, i mean i lose you i want to hold on to your curiosity at the moment i hope that it's okay with you lokendra yeah absolutely okay uh okay so i'll move on then if there are no further questions okay <clears throat> so uh for we his fellow countrymen were his audience and so who is your audience when you're writing a research proposal any responses either in the chat or um just say it out loud who do you think is your audience when you're writing a research proposal obviously professors okay while writing proposal i feel like uh, professors are our audience okay sure yeah they definitely are yeah but they are not the only ones yeah well cool. i think uh, funding agency okay yeah funding agency yes if you are writing yeah i think profess and a curious mind a curiosity full mind a curious mind will most attract the that research i do the curious mind and i want that help to more creative to get him more information about that sure um can i add like probably we are ourselves we are our first audience because i feel once you've written it down um you are reading it and then um probably you want to make changes to it so um first it is uh, the person who's writing the proposal and then um everybody else like they, we've all mentioned professors and everyone else so Sure, sure. Yeah, Roshni, very well. I mean, uh, Ananya has also mentioned peers and faculty members, and I agree with Roshni. I mean, we ourselves are a our first audience uh, because uh, a lot of times, um, until and unless you've put that thought on paper, you haven't really seen that uh, before. It's still unseen to you. Uh, it's something as I was mentioning it that idea is elusive. It's fragmentary. so only when you put it in words and you're putting it in words probably for the first time on a research proposal um you become your own audience you actually see what's in your mind the invisible actually becomes visible in a certain sense 
and the research community of course this includes peers uh, professors all the other people that you've already mentioned and of course funding agencies um i've written funding agencies here because you might apply for scholarships or you might apply for other kinds of fundings uh, so they all uh, would require a research proposal so a research proposal that you send them would probably be a little bit more uh, concise and not as long as you might require for uh, this uh, for your phd or your bs Uh, in the institution, but uh, it's still a research proposal. The structure almost remains the same, but it's just the writing becomes a little concise. Okay. So the next question then. So for V, his ideas were to inspire change of regime. What is the purpose of your ideas in research proposal? Responses. It can vary depending on the area in which you're conducting your research, like. For example, if I'm conducting a research based on, let's say, students with disabilities or from caste, backward caste, or socio-economic disadvantage background difficulty that they face in education, then my purpose might be also to, I mean, if not if I undertake a small research, maybe not, but if it's a large scale, might be to bring about awareness and effect change, okay. and advocacy maybe. Sure, sure. Thanks, Mansi. Yeah, very uh, definitely. Others. I think Shruti has her hand up. Maybe she wants to say something. Yeah, thank you. Uh, two things are currently going on in my mind. One thing is the uh, gender disparity that is going on in the uh, educational research or any other research that we uh, look through. And second is the inclusive aspect because there has been a lot of. Uh, things going on how we can make things inclusive so it's i know it's not the very um, first thing that comes into our mind but i feel uh, inclusivity includes a lot of several different aspects that can make the education or the learning better yeah. okay so this Thank is you. a very very long response to a, a very singular question all of that is definitely true smriti but uh, through all of the things that you've said um analyze it and tell me what is the purpose of your ideas in that case all of the all of that you mentioned right now is all purposeful and it's uh, well intentioned so whatever you're trying to do what is that one adjective you would describe that what is the purpose of these ideas for you to make education reachable okay reachable fine enough uh in yeah, the chat uh, to think, find uh, something ananya Right. I'll just Sorry. read out the chat. Right, and Anya is saying to understand the problem area from my own perspective as an educational researcher and other stakeholders' views to suggest possible solutions. Okay, so it's uh, for example, action research or others which uh, require you to perform change, a very visible change in the field. That is one way of looking at it. Others is to, as you said, change your own perspective and others. Somebody else was also saying something. I think Deepak or. Yeah, I was saying like a very generic thing. The first thing which comes to my mind is I'm looking for something. I want to find something. Okay. So, so through the very idea, through through your very ideas, you are trying to um, find purpose, uh, your own purpose, isn't it? So these very ideas of research, like reading through the literature, you're trying to find purpose for yourself. What to do with them? I mean, uh, somewhere down there, my idea comes from my belief, isn't it? My own philosophy through my uh, observation and research, everything, isn't it? So, so Sambit, my broad uh, talk... speak a little louder. Okay, am I audible now? Yes, yes sir, you are. Yes. So, what I what I meant was, I feel when you talk about the purpose of your ideas, I mean, idea could be anything, but but there could be a belief or something which you care about, isn't it? Something. Uh, Uh, I mean, I care about equitable education in the society. So for me, there could be several steps through which I could provide that. So, so maybe the my major idea or or any broad domain I take, my idea is to achieve that. I might I might go with that assumption or that believe that this is what I want. Uh, I mean, I start with this uh, first step of achieving that, and through that I take some topic which I care about as well. Right. So, yeah. True. Uh, if i might add uh, yeah i also wanted to say that probably uh, the purpose of your ideas should be uh, um with uh, 
how you identify with those ideas and the relevancy as in uh, what you are putting down and how uh, relevant it is at a time that you're writing it and how it will be in the years that is to come. For example, the purpose of your ideas should mainly be change. So uh, the change that you want to bring about. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Roshni. Yeah. Uh, I agree with all of your things that you've mentioned because after all, they are supposed to be your ideas and what you want to do with them. Uh, as you saw that not everybody's idea of uh, within when they're pursuing research is not the same it is never it never is really and that is the beauty of it all everybody does research uh, from a different perspective their ideas are put together for a different uh, you know kind of purpose some people actually know that their ideas that particular community that they're researching on is underrepresented for example and they want to bring notice to that community by researching because they some sometimes they just belong to that community and uh, nothing much has been said about it for others, like Deepak, as you mentioned, they are trying to find their own purpose by reading this literature. Um, and they don't really know where this is going to take them. So everybody's idea of research is going to be different. And there's no singular answer to that. Uh, Pradeep also mentioned the immediate purpose is to convince people that my idea is relevant. Very true. Like when you're writing for an audience, and we are going to talk about it in the next slide. Uh, sometimes uh, you don't really know whether this is a relevant idea to pursue overall. It's only when you present that idea to a community, you gain some sort of legitimacy uh, that this um, something that could be, uh, you know, uh, contributed to knowledge. Not all our ideas, as we were initially talking about, are important, but uh, only when you read in the literature, you find yourself in that research community that you realize that this is something that's worthwhile as a society to pursue. Ananya also said that generate knowledge or contribute to existing knowledge. Very true, something that we were discussing now. So uh, the purpose of your ideas, I would say, uh, could be different things. But in terms of your audience, which is first you, research community, and the funding agency, is to first of all form that idea itself and cause change. Now, change could be many things, as we've already discussed. And the other part is to persuade this audience, um, yourself including others, uh, that this is something that is doable, something that you actually can do uh, within the structure of research proposal that you make. Uh, yeah, but to move on. So uh, when you are uh, writing for the audience that we just discussed, one of the important aspects of a research proposal, and because there's a proposal in the world, I think we all know the meaning of that word very well, um, that it's not something that you can just uh, mention and people will say, okay, you know, just do it. Even in the very introduction that I sent you um, through the introduction that uh, the organizers shared, um, you all, uh, persuasion requires you making different kinds of arguments, arguments that pe convince people that what you're doing is worthwhile. Um, and uh, within a research proposal, what is the persuasion towards? It is, first of all, to highlight the seriousness of the topic that you're trying to research. It's to highlight uh, gaps in the existing knowledge itself. Your persuasion is for all these purposes. It's also towards contribution to the knowledge that exists within that particular area. And uh, most importantly, uh, the last two that I mentioned here is your ability uh, to actually pursue this question and finish it in a given time frame. All of these are important. Just having an idea and putting it on paper is just one part of the thing. But to actually structure it and to show how you're going to pursue this idea and make it happen from A to B, where it is germinates or crystallizes into a thesis and all those steps um, requires foresight and planning, uh, which all your proposal should actually highlight to the audience. Um, that is, first of all, to yourself and to the others. And how does, how does one do it? How does one persuade others? Uh, seriousness of the issue. Now, this is where all the structures of the research proposal come. Uh, when you highlight the seriousness of the issue, you have to sort of um, imagine, imagine sort of a pool and you almost have to, your idea is like a drop in that pool. Um, and that pool is entire, all the other people who worked on that topic. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to create a frame, you're trying to situate yourself in that particular domain, which is through the literature review to highlight that others who came before you probably have not looked at this aspect. And to say that others have not looked at it is a very, very big claim in research, which means that you have been through all the different kinds of literature and writing that has been in that domain and then you're making a claim that 
there is a gap that exists. Uh, and that itself is a contribution. Hi, you know, the very first contribution that you make in a, in a research proposal is to first identify the gaps itself, which can in, on its own take months because reading through that vast literature is not easy. Um, and that is the first acknowledgement that you will get from your supervisors as well. Uh, when they tell you, okay, this is a good gap that you've highlighted and you should be proud of yourself when you, when you sort of identify that. Uh, the seriousness of the issue is also highlighted through the theoretical frame that you, uh, you know, uh, that you put together. And we will talk more about it. What is this theoretical frame and how does one construct it? Gaps in existing knowledge uh, through the literature review, as well as through your research questions. Uh, one persuades people in terms of the seriousness of the research also through the research questions, uh, which might have been looked at through one method, for example, but not through the others. So for a very long time, uh, research in education and other fields was very positivistic, which meant that your instruments were very finely defined. You had this quantitative tool uh, or a scale that you would say, this is what people believe in this area. Um, and that is what research was, positivist for a very long time. But qualitative research completely changed what knowledge is or what it could do. So hence, a lot of the questions are being redone through a qualitative methodology now. So that also is a contribution to knowledge. Uh, then when you also, the way you also persuade people, so uh, community like uh, a research community, like your supervisor and your peers might understand uh, through the literature review and research questions overall that this research is significant because they are part of the same community as you. So if you tell me or others who know uh, things in that domain, for example, literacy, uh, that, you know, this is what I have seen through the literature, this is not being done. I might very well believe you because probably I'm reading something similar to yours. But for example, if you write to a funding agency uh, who are not really uh, uh, people who are uh, immersed in this kind of domain or this reading, you have to, for their understanding, particularly highlight that why is this research significance uh, uh, for the community that you're part of, research community. And the, because they are lay people, they are not part of that community. You have to actually tell them why this is important. And this is where you have to put it in words, the significance of research. This is where that entire section comes in. Uh, next, you will also persuade people on uh, this particular research that you want to pursue on the idea is through your ability to actually structure, plan, and highlight how you're going to conduct this research. This is through research design method and also your prior experience of with these methods if you've done earlier. Now this could include um, you know, open-ended question interviews that you've done either with adults or with children. This might include designing a scale or uh, you know, any kinds of other tools that you've designed and you've used earlier. Uh, so all of those will uh, you know, build in seriousness and persuade people that, okay, this is something that you know, you're capable of doing, your community and others as well. And again, a time frame. Uh, it's very, very important to emphasize that time frames somehow a lot of students neglect, but they're very important to just put there in the research proposal. Uh, because a lot of times when you start doing research, you sort of, it's almost like a flow, you know, you, uh, you just start doing things and then you forget, okay, this is the time that I had decided. And hence you will see there are some PhDs which go on for years together because they don't stick to the timeline. It's important. Uh, because this is not the only research that you will do in your time uh, in your life there are others other questions that are interested to you that you interest you or there are other things that you might be interested in sticking to a timeline will make sure that you finish this and go on to other great ideas or other um, things that you want to research um, i just wanted to highlight this uh, image um, this is standing on the shoulders of giants when we say a literature review is literally that, um, imagine that. And this picture, uh, the metaphor comes from this Greek myth, which says, uh, which is about a blind uh, giant Orion who carried his servant uh, on his shoulders to act as the giant's eyes. Um, now, this is where that metaphor comes from. Uh, and when you start uh, getting more immersed in your own research topic, you will understand the importance of reading other people's work and what that does to your own thought and clarity when you are putting or you're forming your own ideas. Uh, so remember that. Okay, I'm going to pause here for a bit if there are any questions or things that need more clarity. Um, this is just a very rudimentary idea of the structure at the moment. We will go into depth of each of these 
literature review theoretical framework but is there any questions before that or comments lokesh go ahead lokesh yeah, can you bit elaborate on the your ability part again like uh, it is essential to pre decide what kind of methodology or uh, uh, a design that i am going to follow for the pro the proposed uh, for the my for my proposal do you like is it or like later also i can find out little bit of like for example um, like in in rolling out some something like you will not you will not be sure that it will be end of the, this is the process that i'm going to do but you will follow something like need assessment or a baseline something like that right sorry yeah you will yeah i mean so the part of the method um, your ability is that uh, when you putting together research design and this as i said happens over a period of time right you might put a literature review together and then you might show it to your supervisor and when you are reading the literature review itself you will see there are certain methods that are used for that particular question and you might either select the same methods or you might want to do something differently as i said that if something has been done from a very positivistic point of view in your domain uh, what you tend to do then is choose a different method that might help you understand or, or contribute to knowledge differently um, and your ability is to identify that method is to identify that method which will help you um, you know will direct you towards that direction Uh, and uh, add to the knowledge that uh, the gap that you have that you've identified um, and your ability is all of those things identify the proper research design the tools um, and also if you have prior experience that actually just helps you sharpen your method a little bit more yeah ekta i think i have i have uh, a f- i think two questions if you could ahead, you could answer if you now or maybe because you might have more slides coming in so uh, one question was uh, so uh, what mm-hmm. what do you feel is the part of the literature review uh, so do the research questions come out of the re- literature review or do the research questions lead you towards the literature review uh, you know so do you so it, or is it does it happen simultaneously like you read something and then you that was one and the other one was so uh, we've been uh, kind of uh, going through the research methodology course mm. uh, at this uh, and uh, in that uh, you know uh, our teacher was talking about the ontological position that you might have to take so how important is that uh, you know do we need to actually mention our ontological position in the research like when we write and yeah so you could answer whenever You. sure sure thanks avis and those are both very important questions and i think i'll sort of reserve them until the end and if they still are not answered we'll take them up again thanks for those questions okay um i'm uh, generally there is a whole structure of introduction and then methods and other things but i'm first going to highlight the theoretical framework uh, overall because i uh, this is not spoken about enough and i think this has repercussions on your entire research proposal Uh, in terms of what you can or cannot do with your research and what sort of methods you can actually select all of those are uh, very uh, bounded by the theoretical from uh, frame that you make so what is a theoretical frame i would say that uh, see a theoretical frame as creating a niche for yourself it's like a small cabin in a forest where you decide what is the source of light the way this affects the other things in your room like the temperature what you can or cannot see how are all of these things related to each other in short you lay down the rules of your land uh, so its theoretical frame is almost like a, a microscope or some sort of an instrument that you have to see the world differently from what it's visible to our eyes so i've used the example of this frame from inception movie where uh, you are almost like a researcher uh, you know standing and you and you see the world the way it's structured physically but there is something else that is going on in this world uh, there are various structures sociological uh, because we are in social sciences i'm using that example uh, which which are uh, not visible but they actually affect your life on a day to day basis uh, for example if you look at the whole theory of karl marx which is very class based uh, until we before we had that theory i don't think uh, there was an understanding of the way the class affects us and the way the whole the, which led to so many revolutions in the world 
economic, social, and all different kinds is because it uh, marks uh, showed people to look at the effects of class on every single thing that we do. And this is what uh, theoretical frames can do. They can affect change in the world. They can show you what, uh, you know, what theories can do on a day-to-day -day basis in your own life. So very simple example, let's look at uh, class in education. If you look at class in education, uh, we suddenly get a structure of vertical as well as horizontal in our mind. We know class is vertical. There is something that is below, there is something that is top. Without this idea of class, which is very, very theoretical, we don't really see that vertical and horizontal uh, you know, bifurcation of society. Uh, if you add caste to it, then you see a three layered process. That is why that is the way one theory would make you show caste. But if you read, for example, other people who've written about caste, they would show you society from a very different perspective. All of these perspectives are possible because of your theoretical frame. And one of the reasons that students find theoretical frame, I mean, I found it difficult for some time is because uh, we stop ourselves uh, from imagining the world differently. And putting a theoretical frame, as I was telling you earlier, is an act of creativity. It's an act of imagination. You need to imagine the world differently from what it is. Um, and also there is a huge amount of metaphorical thinking required when you're putting together a theoretical frame. Um, and when Havis was asking me questions about the ontological and the epistemological assumptions, um, they all are part of your theoretical frame. Uh, so for example, when, uh, when Marx is talking about class, for example, there is a certain kind of reality that he's trying to frame in his whole niche or cabin. There are certain epistemological questions that he's or assumptions that he's trying to make. Uh, so let's get into a detail about what is this ontological question. Ontological questions are basically what exists. Uh, if Marx is saying class is something that exists in society, he's trying to make sure that you understand how this exists through different kinds of things that he's actually elaborated on. So he's looked at resources, he's looked at labor, and how do these interact with each other to show you how that class actually exists, right? And he's also trying to make answer some very epistemological question. That is, how do we know? So he tells you very in a very detailed manner that how the idea of labor, the way that the labor is spent, the how the capitalist or the relationship between a capitalist and say a worker, how does that uh, elaborate the idea of labor or how does value get created? All of these are where, where he, all, all of these are ways where he's detailed how these different idea of class exist in different sections of the society. So the first branch is ontology. So ontology is basically study of being, which is concerned with what actually exists in the world about which humans can acquire knowledge. Ontology helps researchers recognize how certain they can be about nature and the existence of objects they are researching. For instance, what truth claims can a researcher make about reality? Who decides the leg legitimacy of what is real and how do researchers deal with different and conflicting ideas of reality, right? So um, if you're going to say something exists, you also need to have the instruments to show uh, how this knowledge can be made uh, visible to people around you. So for example, uh, the very idea in positivist research for a very long time was that reality exists because the scale tells me that this is the way the reality exists. For example, in education, all the instruments of intelligence were scales that were defined. If a child achieves a score of 60 or 70 on a scale, intelligence was defined as that. So for them, intelligence existed through the idea of the scale itself. Now, if a constructivist is coming here and you know questioning that very idea of scale, he, uh, that person who's doing research within a constructivist framework his or her ideas of ontology and epistemology would be that I do not think intelligence is a singular idea, which means reality is not singular for them, which is an ontological idea, reality. They would say that knowledge can be gained only through the constructivist idea, which means communication between community members. It's constructed. It's not something that is there. Uh, knowledge is constructed again and again by community members. So you see how very different ideas exist um, within research methodologies. And it's very important to know that where you place yourself within these different ontological and epistemological claims. Uh, let's read a little bit about epistemology more. So the second branch is epistemology, the study of knowledge. Epistemology is concerned with all aspects of the validity 
scope and methods of acquiring knowledge, such as what constitutes a knowledge claim, how can knowledge be acquired or produced, and how the extent of its transferability can be assessed. Epistemology is important because it influences how researchers frame their research in their attempts to discover knowledge. By looking at the relationship between a subject and an object, we can explore the idea of epistemology. I want to say something about mixed methods here. Um, so there are people who use mixed methods where they might use a scale and they might also use qualitative ideas or qualitative tools to add to that knowledge, uh, right? And one of the reasons they do that is because they believe ontologically that reality can not just be deciphered through these scales. It requires epistemological understandings or ontological understandings from a qualitative point of view as well. And hence, they actually what they do is they mesh both of them together because their idea of how the world exists is just not limited to those scales or from a different point of view, not just in conversations, but scales as well, right? I'm going to pause here a little bit because this was a little um, abstract conversation, but uh, yeah, it'll help how much you've gotten and if there are further questions. Uh, so I think uh, Ananya kind of uh, um, put a question in the chat. Uh, she asks, uh, when you say prior experience, do you mean that it implicitly helps you uh, in developing the research design or also explicitly makes it makes makes it clear to the audience what you have done earlier you can answer later as well no, i can answer it right now Ananya. so uh, prior experience means that um, it will help you understand these ontological and epistemological questions also a little better right so when you already have experience interviewing you will see that how sometimes when people say, um, you know, if you ask them a question, whatever they say, uh, sometimes in that one interview, you don't really understand what their reality or uh, their society is and how they are making meaning. You need to go again and again to that field in order to understand um, how they are making truth claims about their own life. And hence, um, I've said this again and again, I'm very against just one-time interviews because they don't really help you understand about things. Uh, you can't really make truth claims about that field or that community if you just go once because connecting with people and uh, acquiring knowledge about that field requires um, you know multiple visits um, so that is other other kind of complexity of making uh, truth claims or how you acquire knowledge um, and when you have the prior experience of this method uh, what it helps you do is that uh, it helps you sharpen uh, your methods better because you know what works and what does not um, and in other case, what it helps you do is you then sometimes select a very different method from what you've never tried to just see what kind of uh, uh, knowledge claims can you make by, uh, you know, trying this method out, uh, you know, so yeah, different things you can do, but any kind of experience with any method just helps you understand how uh, this whole idea of truth claim works within research better. Hi, Ekta, I had a question. Hi, Vinita. Yes, go. Let's go back to the previous uh, slide. Uh, hmm. Yeah, Sorry. I just wanted to understand. So, this, I, so when you say theoretical framework, right, is it also something aligning with existing frameworks? Let's say like, and you kind of then create your own theoretical framework? Or, you know, where do we position ourselves? Because often, um, you know, one has always said, what is your theoretical framework? It is not something which you just arrive at one day. It's something which is there. And then you kind of pick what you're leaning towards from your own uh, research question. Right. So I'm, yeah, at this point, I'm a little uh, confused about it. Sure, sure. Thanks, thanks, Vinita. Um, let's let's look at this this way. When your uh, your theoretical framework is also about the way you look at the world, right? And your ontological and your epistemological assumptions all become part of your theoretical framework. So, for example, when I said from a sociological point of view or social cultural theory, for example, uh, which is very common, which is ideas of Vygotsky or uh, you know that knowledge is basically uh, construction, uh, uh, knowledge is construction, and it happens when uh, different people in the community uh, talk to each other and thought is generated that way. It's not something in your mind, but it is socially constructed. So if your reality um, is about uh, that knowledge is outside in the world and not in your brain, your theoretical framework will have to reflect that, which means you cannot use 
uh, positivist frameworks or uh, positivist ontological frameworks for your theoretical frame. Uh, you cannot use scales of intelligence and other things to say that this is intelligence. You will say that intelligence exists within the activity theory because it's something that's constructed outside, right? So uh, definitely there are theories that already exist, um, but um, there are theories that exist which show the world in a certain way. Uh, but maybe that is not the way that you are imagining uh, that these are the way the relations in the society work. Uh, what, so what you do is you don't just choose one theory. You look at different writers who've written about that idea uh, from different perspectives. So for example, class itself. Marx is not the only person who's written about class. There are people who are Dalit writers who've written about class uh, from their own perspectives, which is probably sometimes different from how uh, Marx, Marx puts it within the Indian society. Right. So what it hap what happens then is uh, somebody used the word nuance early on before we started this conversation. Um, your whole idea, the way you look at the world, gains more nuance uh, because although you're choosing one theoretical concept, for example, uh, what it does is you choose different writers to elaborate the reality uh, that makes sense to you for your question. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, Ananya asked a question. Um, I'm not sure if you'll be addressing this, uh, but it will help to discuss conceptual versus theoretical framework. Yeah, we will be coming to that, Ananya. Thanks for that question. Okay, so I'm going to move on because people are asking questions for stuff that I already have in the next slides. Okay, um, I'm going to share the link of this particular slide and maybe just through the PPT itself, but this is a very helpful um, idea of how the ontological questions, the epistemological questions, how they influence your theoretical frame, right? So this, uh, these two writers, uh, what they have done is they have written about how reality is imagined in different kinds of uh, philosophical text um, as one that really exists. So for some reality is just a singular idea, but then there are others who say that reality is not one, but it exists in multiple um, there are multiple realities that exist, right? And when you, uh, so it's almost like a spectrum and you could be within the spectrum anywhere, right? And that will decide your reality, the way you see your world. And then again, how does, your, uh, how does that affect your uh, questions based on knowledge? You might be somebody, if you say that your reality, just ex if there's just one reality, you might use some, uh, you know, uh, some pre-decided instruments to acquire knowledge on that particular uh, reality, while there are others who say there are multiple realities that exist. So for example, for you, community one, what kind of knowledge they have might be different from other community. There is no, no one singular truth claim. And that is what affects your theoretical frame then, um, which we just discussed, right? Positivist, post-positivist, structuralist, all of these are different kinds of theoretical frames that you will use then. Basically, a theoretical frame, more generally to simply put it, is basically uh, put together by answering these two very important questions. That is, how do you see the world? Um, just simply, and how can you make any truth claim about the way that non that world is arranged? These are the basically the two understandings or two very simplistic understandings of ontology and epistemology. And they both have very important uh, repercussions on your theoretical frame as well as your methods, right? And you can look at them at, at your own time. Okay, I think we've paused already. So we've looked at theoretical framework. We've looked at how it has repercussions on your methods, your design, uh, what kind of instruments you can choose for your research. So now at the moment, we are in a very broad area of education. Uh, you have secondary topics that you want to pursue. Somebody said disability studies within education. Somebody said caste, um, you know, there are different uh, kinds of concepts that you already have within a broader idea of education, right? Um, and what do you want to pursue within this is also decided by the very first conversation that we had about the power of ideas. You want to pursue these ideas because they are important to you. You think that you can bring about some kind of change by pursuing these different ideas, right? Um, and I would say that always hold, and hold on to that very initial uh, uh, affiliation that you have with your ideas, because that will carry you through the entire research um, and also through the entire research proposal that you put together. Um, in my own experience, what I felt is that uh, once you start talking to different kinds of people, they will also uh, channelize your ideas through different kinds of domains of literature that already exist. 
Uh, so for example, when I wanted to first pursue figurative language, some people push me towards linguistics. There are others who push me towards aesthetics. Uh, but these were not really ideas that were, uh, this was not really a literature that was helping in terms of uh, clarifying the kind of research that I wanted to do. It was not the motivation through which I had first started doing research. So I would say that all the uh, uh, cursory thoughts that you have at the moment, which have brought you to, re brought you to research, uh, pen them down. Write your personal affiliation with these ideas and keep that document with you because that is going to be a motivation that helps you also to channelize Sometimes when you go, uh, when you read so much text and you read so many different things, it's going to take you in different directions, which is great. But that uh, initial text that you have of that affiliation with that idea will also help you scope, you know, put a wall around that idea that, okay, this is the scope that I was, I'd initially started with and probably I want to stick with it. Um, and if not, then at least you know that, you know, you moved on from that initial idea. So I would say either draw a mind map or write about it. So narrowing your research problem and your research question. So somebody asked uh, just a few slides before that, how does it happen? Do you find your research question while you're reading through the literature or your research question initially guides you to it? I would say it happens both ways. Uh, so you have a very broad idea of disability studies, for example, and you start reading through different kinds of text, either your supervisor has uh, you know, recommended or other people have recommended. So somewhere you find yourself reading something that is closely associated with your own interest. And what happens through the process is that you find people who've written about it, you find methods that have already been done, um, and you start slowly understanding or finding your way through the literature. Um, so your research question either moves from that particular area to the different area, um, and you start developing your own understanding, your own connections uh, within that field overall. And sometimes you find that, okay, this field is not something that is helping me understand it enough, but I need to club it with something else, right? Uh, education and disability study is all right, but what, what about methodologies? You know, this is not something that's been written about. So what you do is you start reading about methodologies as a concept itself, right? So uh, this, is, this is how the entire research problem from broad, it becomes narrow um, as you find your way through the literature. One of the things that is important is that, uh, you know, uh, keep reading week by week. Um, it's a consistent and a persistent habit that one has to develop that uh, after reading through one week, always try to give yourself some time um, to just, you know, um, jot down or summarize the ideas that you have had through the week. Uh, this could be questions that you, that are, again, questions that are coming up while you're reading your literature. Uh, about the theoretical frame that people are using to so the methods people are using or the literature overall, what, where is it going, in which directions. So one useful way is to develop a document which uh, summarizes the literature that you're reading or a paper in terms of its theoretical frame, its methods and its conclusions, right? This is always helpful to keep going back to. Um, and then working towards that to operationalize your research questions. And we're going to talk about a little bit in terms of what does it mean to operationalize research questions uh, through an example that I've put forth here. For example, you're reading literature and I've used literacy here because that's a common topic within the education department. Um, and literacy has taken all kinds of directions. It's something that I'm also currently reading about. Um, and you can read about image, emergent literacy. You can read about literacy in everyday practices. You can read literacy about in the schooling practices. So it's taking all kinds of directions. So when you're reading through that literature, you slowly come to make your own understanding that do you want to place your questions of literacy or research questions either within the schooling context or something that you want to see outside the school? Or do you want to compare the schooling or the outside literacy practices, right? So when you're reading through this literature, you start developing your own affiliations towards it. Now, for example, uh, let's take one question and see how this connects with all the other questions of literature review concepts and other things. So I've taken one question that is, what are the community-led literacy practices in the everyday life of Bhil tribe in Madhya Pradesh? Um, this seems to be a specific question within the domain of literacy, but is still very broad, right? And then the other question I've taken it, taken is how are they different from the everyday literacy practices of the tribe in Maharashtra? So what I am making an assumption and is that, and which is also true, that the Bhil tribe is spread over different parts of the country. The literacy practices in one state of the tribe, how are they different from the 
other uh, the other sociological area that they're situated in these are two questions i've looked at and why do i say broad because when i use the word literacy i need to define my research question what do i mean by that and when i say different how are they different right so one of the uh, things that uh, anane was talking about is conceptual framework now through that question of literacy within the bill tribe what i've done is i've taken the conceptual framework here designed a conceptual framework for that particular question so a conceptual framework is a written or a visual representation of an expected relationship between variables and these variables are simply the characteristics or priorities that you want to want to study uh, place in the study itself so in the first question when i'm yeah so when i'm talking about what are the community led literacy practices in the everyday life of bill in my conceptual framework what i've done is i've actually defined i've taken a concept which i'm going to elaborate in the research question so for me literacy in the bill tribe is the practices of agriculture and child rearing so these are two variables that i've taken and these are also going to be part of my conceptual framework now within that i have taken two dependent variables which is within agriculture the very act of learning agriculture within that community which is for me it's a literacy practice is defined by the resources that are available for that community as well as the actions and the way i'm going to look at the two questions where i'm going to compare the literacy practices of the bill tribe in say madhya pradesh and maharashtra are going to be through these two variable and dependent variables and when i'm writing a literature review uh, and i'm you know putting together my research proposal i'm going to write about agriculture as an idea that exists overall in society and how indigenous practices uh, or understandings of agriculture have evolved over uh, different tribes in india and then i'm also going to look at in terms of the bhil tribe how they are understanding agriculture overall and what are the literacy practices within it if there is work that is already done within this um, idea of literacy i'm going to also going to quote that and also highlight the gaps within it this is how i'm going to build my argument as well as i'm going to uh, pursue this idea of literacy overall similarly is something that i'm going to do with the child rearing practice so if one looks at yeah if one looks at the theoretical framework it's going to be consisting of literacy overall as a practice then there's going to be another idea of literacy within uh, bhil tribe and indigenous practices and then specifically agriculture and child rearing so this is how when you are putting together a theoretical framework or literature review you are going to go uh, from very broad area to a very narrow area which takes you towards your question and highlights to your audience that why this is an important study to do and what are the gaps in the studies that have already been done and what are you going to add to that existing knowledge <clears throat> okay i'm going to take a pause any questions at the moment are you still with me yes if you can so, you just go over this conceptual framework just briefly once again sure just, just to yeah. tell me what you've understood neeta and what you haven't like what seems still i got lost between this and the theoretical framework okay you got lost between that okay sure are we going to get the ppt yes yes you will um so um a conceptual framework is basically part of your theoretical framework in your theoretical framework for example as i said that uh, you are going to use um, uh, you know you're going to understand your ontological as well as your epistemological questions right and then what you do is uh, from there you go on towards your conceptual framework you highlight the different kinds of concept that you're going to look at in your research and how you're going to examine it what is the method that you're going to use to examine some of these your conceptual framework also becomes part of your literature review as well it becomes part of your theoretical as well as your uh, you know uh, uh, theoretical as well as your uh, literature review uh, mostly when you're writing about just the literature overall and not the methods then it becomes part of your a uh, literature review but if you want to also look at the different kinds of methods that been used uh, to uh, to study these different concepts then you also make it part of your theoretical framework does that help anita so for example agriculture in terms of resources and actions 
have only been understood, for example, from a very qualitative framework, right? And that is what you highlight in your theoretical framework. Uh, but say there is nothing that has been documented from a symbolic or a semiotic perspective where you see how people actually understand each other through actions and what are the actions or gestures they make while learning about agriculture within the community. That is something that is that, that has not been studied. So what you do is you mention the gap within that in your theoretical framework and you say probably I want to look at the semiotics of how literacy practices work through symbols uh, within this literacy practice. Thank you. That's good. Anybody else? So uh, basically Ekta, what we are doing is we are taking a hold of a topic mm -hmm. uh, as in, um, a fixed or an established topic and then uh, the gaps that you were talking about uh, over there basically we are putting uh, our comparative analysis something like that as in uh... right. um, there is an established body of research that exists definitely and what you're yeah I mean what you're trying to do is you're trying to go through that literature that's already there in that field you're trying to make connections with your own ideas and what you're trying to do is that uh, you're trying to situate yourself within that established literature as I said you're standing on the shoulders of giants uh, that is what is what is what exactly what you're trying to do. You're trying to say that this is what has been done and these are the gaps. Um, I wouldn't say it's a comparative, it's not a comparison so as to speak, but it's to see that where the gaps in the knowledge exist and what is it that you can do with your own ideas to contribute to that knowledge, right? Yeah, okay. And sometimes, um, sorry. No, 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 go ahead, then I'll, I'll ask. Yeah. And sometimes what happens is that uh, when you're new to this kind of uh, research um, and you don't really know which established domain that you want to study, um, that is the reason you might have to study various kinds of established domains to then situate your own research uh, to say that, okay, this is exactly which is helping me. This kind of domain is helping me, uh, you know, channelize my questions or channelize my research. Uh, for example, when one looks at literacy overall, uh, there are different kinds of writings on literacy uh, outside India, within India, and you have to go through that entire kind of literature to make sense of what, where do you actually place your initial research questions on. For example, this very uh, question that I've highlighted about literacy practices in every day in terms of Bhil tribe. Uh, there is so much in terms of literacy uh, in outside India, which talks about literacy from the perspective of um, everyday practices, but sometimes it does not help you understand how uh, that literature will work in an indigenous context in India. And so what you do then is, uh, because that literature is not helping you channelize your thoughts, uh, you look at uh, another domain to see, okay, if that is making sense to me. For example, this very idea which I gave you about social semiotics, um, what it does is it helps you look at the very actions that the tribes use uh, to convey knowledge to each other how the actions overall become meaningful um, and to look at that frame and to see your question within that frame um, gives you a different kind of perspective about knowledge, isn't it? It helps you make a knowledge claim that you know, actions for these tribes are in itself very meaningful. Um, and that is where your theoretical framework also then comes in, right? So that literature that helps you put this very thought uh, into a research question is coming from that theoretical frame. It is coming from that reality or that ontological reality that this literature is trying to create and helping you give meaning um, and to channelize your research questions. So that is why I said initially that, uh, you know, stick to your thoughts, uh, stick to your initial ideas because they're very powerful. Uh, don't get lost in all kinds of readings that you do. Um, if you are uh, sort of, there with your initial ideas and that is what gives you direction uh, it sometimes helps you make knowledge claims that have never been made in that field and that can only happen if you are confident about some of your initial ideas because after all your own ideas are coming from uh, your own experiences in the field your own communities that you have been part of right sorry Deepak and Ananya please go ahead yeah I was just thinking uh, uh, could you please guide if there are certain best practices while we, you know, uh, while we optimize uh, our literature review? Uh, 
in fact i mean there is there is huge, huge potential to you know diverge in various direction and then we converge also but in this process can we optimize this process in certain ways if, if there are certain best practices around that um uh, spoken truly like a corporate guy deepak <laughs> there is no uh, personally i am a very bad person to talk about optimization because um i mean when i'm reading literature i'm always thinking about uh, i'm when i'm reading it it's it's sort of like a flow you know it takes me in all kinds of directions and i'm very happy about uh, going in different directions um so optimization one way to is that keep um, your timeline in mind um if you've read a certain kind of literature and you you think that you found your way just stick to that and work your way through it uh, if you still feel that uh, it's still not answering your questions or not giving you a helpful direction then ask your supervisor i think your supervisors are your uh, guides in terms of optimizing and guiding you better uh, these are only processes that we've learned from our own teachers as well so yeah i would say speak to your supervisors if you feel lost okay sure thanks ekta i just want to uh, ask uh, in terms of uh, the difference between uh, you know positivism and post positivism mm. is exact is it just like thing some qualitative methods but at the end of the day it's still positivism or no the very idea of post positivist is that uh, you look at the world not through the uh, scientific idea of um you know visibility as in through the through the eyes itself uh, so science um, positivist frameworks are very good at developing different instruments of uh, characterizing or developing methods that make uh, you know things visible that you have to actually quantify them the very idea of positivism was quantifying everything um and uh, in a very uh, sort of number or quantitative way uh, that numbers are important um and uh, post positivism is all about that that uh, truth about people's knowledge people's experiences are also important and uh, if you i mean there's a history behind where the positivist methods come from there it comes from the very separation of your um, experiences your bodily experiences from your mind um and they think that knowledge is something that is quantifiable and it's in your brain Uh, and not something that your bodily actions can help you understand knowledge does not exist in experiences and post positivism is all about breaking that divide between uh, the body and the mind it's about uh, complicating that very idea of the body and the mind that your experience in the world also generate knowledge um, people around you the way you uh, you know interact with them are all part of that knowledge making process and meaning making process uh, so yeah i mean it's a very big break in terms of yeah, so meaning the ontological position is that of constructivism within or, uh, within post positivism yes, because yes okay yes. okay post positivism is all about construction of meaning okay um it's not something that is fixed yeah uh, really a question but uh, just observation the very reason i asked you whether you will be uh, discussing this uh, conceptual framework is that uh like while reading many of the dissertations uh, like uh, ehd or even masters or mphils uh, i have seen that people almost use conceptual framework and theoretical framework interchangeably as if they are one and the same thing mm. and uh, now since you have used this term variables i was also just thinking whether it is it has something to do with quantitative and qualitative or uh, research mm. designs where you use one or is this like an essential part of any research proposal where you have you talk about existing theories in your theoretical framework and then the conceptual framework is more specific to your own research including the methods that you will be using uh, and so on so it was just uh, like something that i was thinking i don't know if it is a question <laughs> worth addressing yeah no very true ananya uh, the very so a lot of our knowledge about research um and i mean you will be surprised to know I, i think a lot of you know as well this very idea of philosophy so to speak uh philosophy was not just philosophy that we understand now um science overall um and uh, the very understanding of how knowledge is gathered and research has evolved um through a very singular idea and over the years it has branched out so our 
um, ideas and our knowledge about research itself um, is still based in uh, some of the earlier terms that we know from positive science or whatever you call it. Um, so when we talk about variables, uh, we are talking about, uh, yeah, I mean, understanding of variables is very, uh, from a very scientific positivist perspective, but any kind of research that you do, uh, variables are always there. Uh, so they are almost like concepts. Um, and let's look at this very example of uh, the Beale tribe, right? Uh, when we're looking at a question like this, what, what are the community-led literacy practices in the everyday life of Bhil tribe? Um, literacy is the overall idea, right? But within that, when we start talking about child rearing practices or agriculture, these become concepts. Um, and these concepts, of course, uh, your variables are going to be part of the problem that you want to highlight. They are part of your specific questions. Um, and literature review also is part of your research question, isn't it? Uh, you can't just um, write a literature review on any concept. It has to be embedded within the research question that you're actually looking at. Uh, why would you look at literature, literature within literacy, within this particular question? Because it's part of your broader, um, broader uh, questions that you want to study. Uh, and within that, as you keep narrowing down your um, uh, broader questions to very specific operationalized questions, that's when your variables also start coming through. Um, it's when you start defining literacy in terms of say home, uh, experience, all of these become part of your uh, variables. And then through that, then you find dependent variables as well. Um, it's, it's, uh, it seems almost at the moment that how will when one do this, but once you start getting into the literature review, once you start reading through the literature, some of these variables and dependent variables, all, you know, they all started start making sense. And one of the one of the things that I've learned how to start, uh, uh, you know, narrowing these ideas down is that imagine almost like where you want to conduct your research, your research design. How are you imagining your research is going to take place? So if you're imagining a build in the everyday practices of the community, you already know that it is outside the school, right? So your home is not part of your research question. Um, and then you talk about community overall. How do you define your community? Who are the people within the community where you're going to design your research with? So as in when you start looking at your question, start questioning every single word in your question uh, that you have put forth. It will help you start narrowing down, asking questions, and also narrowing down on some of these concepts that we're talking about. Um, and hopefully that will also help you go towards your research design and your methodology as well. So already we've discussed a very constructivist idea of literacy making here through this question, because we are talking about the everyday practices and everyday practices involve talking to people, um, actions within the community, right? So you already know the kind of method that you're going to pursue through this particular broader question as an example. Okay, <clears throat> I'm gonna take a pause just to see if there are questions. I do have a slide where we look at uh, each section of the um, this structure as well, but I don't know whether we have enough time. Yeah. So this is one resource that I've used throughout in terms of writing my research proposal. And uh, I'm just going to read you a little bit about the literature review. And what it helps you do is it helps you understand what is the purpose of each of this section and how it's going to help you put together your argument overall. And it says that a literature review surveys books, scholarly articles, and any other sources relevant to a particular issue, area of research or theory, or by doing so provides a description, summary, as well as a critical evaluation of these works in relation to the research problem. And literature reviews are designed to provide an overview of sources you have explored by researching a particular topic and to demonstrate to your readers how your research fits within a larger field of study. And uh, a literature review may consist of simply a summary of key sources, but in social sciences, a literature review uh, usually has an organizational pattern and combines both summary and synthesis. So um, for a lot of times, what uh, in the literature review, you might read something and uh, you might summarize it uh, as in how you've understood, but a critical uh, reading of that is very important. Uh, in terms of your own topic. So for example, if somebody is writing about uh, literacy in terms of that previous question we discussed about everyday practices, and you say that the everyday practices for this writer is described as this, this, and that, 
but you also highlight that it does not really highlight uh, the practices of indigenous communities, for example. And this particular topic is this particular reading does not provide you helpful understandings on those. And hence, to look at this, understand the indigenous practices, then you quote another source. So whatever you're doing with your literature review, you have to be true to your scope and your ideas, uh, your research questions. That will guide you towards how much to review and what to review in terms of literature. Yeah, and similarly, there are uh, smaller readings and longer explanations for each of these sections. Um, this I'm going to share this presentations with presentation with you, and hopefully it'll help you go through uh, each section. Um, and after you read through this and you're stuck somewhere, um, I think we can you can always contact me and we can probably have a longer conversation on those sections which are not clear. Uh, but uh, the best way to go through this is that, uh, you know, just start working on it, uh, start working on each of the sections so that you know what is it that you understood and what is it that you still lack. Um, the only way that you will learn is uh, by doing this. There is no other way. Um, I mean, I've been part of various sessions on literature review and the only way one learns is by doing it. There is no other way. So again, uh, your the way that you persuade your audience is by seriousness of the issue, which can be done through these different structures, your contribution to the knowledge by highlighting the gaps and your abilities through uh, detailing the research questions, methodology and design. Right. Okay, I'm going to pause here and uh, see if there are any further questions. I had a quick question about timelines. When you say timelines, uh, how how um, how strict must one be with that? And uh, realistically, I think literature review itself takes so much time. So if you're not um, liberal with yourself at that point, and I think it kind of affects all the other uh, things which, which are going to come up. So what, what would a timeline one needs to give? Um, so timeline is basically about usually, uh, you know, when you, so, I think you in your PhD, you start putting your research proposal together by the second year. Um, and that's when you also have sort of a presentation, you know, where your proposal gets accepted or suggestions are made formally. So you have a year almost to read literature and uh, go through different parts. And this is only for your research proposal. But I think one point I did not mention, and this needs to be uh, well understood, at least for PhD students, that your literature review never stops. You keep reading until the end. Uh, till you write your thesis, because there are nuances that you find out when you collect data that you probably haven't explored, and then you make part of your research. Uh, so uh, it's not the end of it, like research proposal is not the end of literature review. Uh, that happens throughout your PhD, if that's, in, I mean, if that's helpful in any way. Uh, Ekta, I also, uh, I mean, <laughs> what you said is so true. Uh, at one point, I think in one of your slides, uh, you said that, uh, like, read two or three authors, right? Uh, so one thing is, how do you even, I mean, of course, you know, certain people who would have written uh, a lot on it. But then does it also kind of narrows uh, your, the way you're looking at the area, because they would also come from a certain position, right? Mm. I mean, how do you go from there to some different kind of perspective which you want to understand right. uh, in order to uh, even like uh, frame your questions in a way that uh, encapsulates what you're trying to study? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't come from just one sort of uh, this thing, right? Like uh, Very I'm true, Anand, very true. Um, I think one of the things that, uh, uh, you know, that we do is that we only talk to people in our own centers um, and to get different perspectives is uh, to actually when you're uh, going through journals uh, on a particular topic for example literacy there are journals on literacy um, and uh, there are authors who've written about it and the best part is to write to these people sometimes they themselves are exploring different perspectives um, from the ones that they have written at least that's what I have found. So it's to write to these people, email them and talk to them. Uh, the other thing is to talk to people outside your center. 
um i have actually been very uh, lucky in terms of uh, when i'm written to people who are in different institutes across india on a particular topic they have generously devoted you know given their time they have answered my questions over email or even taken phone calls so i think uh, uh, academicians are generally interested to you know part their knowledge uh, all the people who have been working in different areas and the thing is just email these people and talk to them i think it's very important to talk to academicians outside our, our own institutes uh, because as as you rightly pointed out when we are in a particular community we only tend to think of it in a particular way but if you talk to people beyond that you know it helps you broaden your point of view as well and they will give you sources of different kinds of ways to look at it um, and hopefully that will take you in different directions uh, but i've also found that uh, there's at some point you need to stop doing that you can't keep writing to people and read different kinds of things all the time at some point you have to be true to your timeline you have to know that you have to finish the thesis you can't be reading literature all the time um, and i have been guilty of doing that that i've just been reading and not writing and not uh, you know uh, actually finishing the things that i have have to um, so i've learned it the hard way so I, hopefully you don't have to do that so this is just a last slide of putting together a proposal um, one way that uh, could be useful to you is that always have a uh, you know a peer group where you share your ideas and uh, you know use them as a sounding board it's very important sometimes uh, because you might be reading something and you don't know whether you actually understood it until unless you write it down or discuss it with other people so throughout your phd or research uh, journey you know have people that you discuss your ideas with they could be people in your family or you know others as well because they will ask you questions which will help you sharpen your ideas um reach out to people as i said already in relation to ananya's question that uh, either through email twitter now social media even academicians are on twitter and other forums you know discuss with them and a lot of them actually have reading groups and uh, online groups as well so try to be part of those as well um and also um, i would say that one of the useful things to do uh, about uh, uh, is with your research is that write book reviews of the books you're reading that's always very helpful because what it does is it helps you put together your learning and also there's a piece of writing that you're putting out in the world which might be useful for other students as well so review books that you're reading um also write for very non academic audiences as well like magazines teachers magazines and blog post because it helps you see your research in different ways um you could use your the same understanding and make it useful for different kinds of audiences so it develops your writing skills as well conferences are of course there and journals as well um so these are some ways that uh, might be helpful to acquire different perspectives for your proposal um, as well as uh, develop your own uh, nuance for your topic uh just i'm going to stop here i think i have spoken enough i hope that the session was useful for at least some of you uh, this is the first time i was doing something like this so i've also learned in the process on how i could better connect some of the things i've spoken to you about through your questions so uh, thank you very much for your patient hearing and uh, please do reach out to me um, i might be better in terms of explaining things one to one as well thank you thank you ekta for giving this insightful session on research proposal writing this was very helpful uh we are grateful to you for giving your precious time to us a special thanks to everyone in the audience for joining us today we hope this workshop has helped you in some way or the other you can further reach out to ekta uh through her email id that will be shared in the chat box uh we'll be sharing the recording of this ppt encapsulating all the important resources within the next two days uh we'll now quickly want to take the feedback of the session you can write your feedback in the chat box or reach out to us through our email id which will also be shared for the chat box uh you can also suggest, suggest us what other topics in the academic discourse you want us to cover agar unda minimum 2 or 3 is sir the same this is this is a common question i guess how many i think on one particular concept which means that if uh, if your broader topic is literacy and if you are looking at everyday literacy for example then you at least need to look at uh um, seven or eight readings on different strands of every day um because that literacy is a broad thing but within that there are different nuances different sub concepts so each concept should at least have two to three okay uh, how do we narrow down on the most important works that we have to go through 
that your supervisor is the one that's going to guide you. I think that is so. Uh, don't look at research as a lone wolf journey. <laughs> your, your supervisor is always there to help you, uh, and they are definitely going to tell you which are the most important. And also, I think uh, um, once you start reading papers, you will see there are some references that all writers are using again and again and again, um, and those are the ones that become important in each area. Okay, so you you look into Google Scholar or any other. Um, you, first of all, your supervisors are going to help you. You know, just speak to them first instead of going to Google Scholar because Google Scholar is going to throw you in all different directions. Uh, so just speak to your supervisors first, and then go on to Google Scholar and other people. But your supervisors will give you put you in the right direction first. Uh, Ekta, one more thing quickly. Uh, how about uh, theoretical and empirical papers? Like, how do you? Uh, uh, I mean. It, you give enough uh, equal importance to both, but but of course we come across more empirical papers than theoretical papers. Like mm -hmm. very few pe people seem to be doing theoretical uh, research. I, uh, and uh, how important is that when you are like doing literature review? Because when I am doing a literature review, let us say I look at twenty papers and nineteen of them are empirical, and then there are certain findings in these papers which uh you would like to have in your study right which mm -hmm. favors your understanding of the problem uh so then uh, like how do you balance these things when you are uh, trying to write a proposal because it can't come from this is already there I, and i want to do further more in this that is not i think how you do uh, a proposal so um so one of the things ananya is that uh, uh, you know one also has to sometimes judge one's strength. Mm -hmm. um, so theory is not something that comes to people easily. It takes a lot of time and uh, different kinds of uh, understandings to get into theory. And that can be very, very challenging. Unfortunately, I feel that uh, a lot of discussions around theory are not, uh, are not held in the center. Uh, it's given sort of a cursory glance. Yeah. Um, and so you need to have a proper... Uh, um, almost courses which look at theory um, and you know discussions on theory if that does not happen you have to individually do that so you need to be prepared that if this is something that you want to get into the depths of for example ontological epistemological questions these are all part of your theoretical framework and these are all very deep questions um, if you have the time and you have the energy to get into the depths of these uh, yourself or you find a group i mean it's very worthwhile uh, but if you do not and some students find it very difficult, then you stick to what is available, but you experiment with empirical methods. Um, so I would say that look at the strengths um, and then you know jump into these different questions. Yeah, I agree with Vinita. Yeah, each section is uh, a discussion in itself. And that was one of the challenges I faced that how much time to devote on each. Um, but I stuck to theoretical framework discussion a little bit more because I know that is a little challenging sometimes for people. Thank you everyone for your comments. Yeah, um, I think also give your critical feedback since we're talking about criticality in research. Uh, what are the sections that one could improve on? That would be helpful. Yes, yeah, so I think thanks a lot uh, uh, for this uh, session, Ekta. Like, I mean, I really loved the way, like I, I would never have thought like, like I would be learning research uh, proposal writing through, you know, V for Vendetta and, uh, you know, it was really random. <laughs> so thanks a lot for that. Thanks so much for keeping it so informal, but at the same time, so impactful. I think we all learned a lot. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, uh, I agree with uh, Vinita as well, um, you know, that uh, maybe this is just the beginning, maybe we can explore more. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think so. We've come to the end of the session. Uh, any feedback, any thoughts? Uh, if anyone has, maybe they can share, uh, like in the chat or suggestion on what kind of sessions you want to have for the next workshops. Uh, thank you, Ekta. I mean, uh, usually uh, as students, now that I've just entered the BEDMED program, uh, it is also uh, important that we uh, learn exactly 
yeah, I know that we don't learn how to do research, but then uh, it does develop on our own. But the thing is that um, for someone to make us understand what exactly a proposal is and what, how are you supposed to frame it, the basic ideas that we should be having. So uh, these are the things I think will be very helpful. And I was also talking to uh, Chitra the other day and I was telling her that uh, if we could have more sessions on uh, research itself, because we already uh, study what is there in our curriculum and we also research a lot more uh, on that as well. But uh, for us to understand what research is and what research demands and how are we to approach it as uh, you know, usually PhD is not considered to be um, a subject. It is considered to be at that level where uh, all my teachers and professors, they've told us that, you know, you end uh, your years of studying uh, with masters. And after that, if you want to go into research, it's something else, totally. So th if that, like that could be intimidating uh, in the beginning, but then how to, you know, go ahead with it. And uh, that is what. So today, basically, uh, it was a very enriching session, in fact. So thank you. Thanks, Roshan. Yeah. It's very sad, actually, that research uh, intimidates people. Um, and uh, it's very, very sad. And because uh, it's supposed to be something that anybody and everybody should be able to do. Uh, anybody and everybody should be able to do. And I think one of the things that the center uh, very meaningfully is trying to do is engage practitioners. Uh, within research and to show that, you know, uh, that uh, there are different kinds of research um, and there is not one idea of research. So my ontological understanding of research is that, uh, or epistemological is that uh, there is not one reality. There is no one reality of research, but there are different realities and uh, there are different instruments of doing research, different tools available to us. And hence, when I was talking to Ananya also that uh, maybe Initially, one when one is getting into research, one should also look at one's strengths and weaknesses. And hence, prior experience is important. That if you are somebody who's very good at talking to people and qualitative research is something that you want to pursue, uh, then you should look at methods in that way as well, you know, um, and not focus on theory immediately because that takes time. It's not something difficult, but it will take time. Like, I have a question, like, these kind of sessions will be there, like, regularly, or, like, it's just a starting? It's, it will be once in a month, as of now, hmm. uh, not regularly. So, if we see that we get more time and we're able to engage and get in more people who are working in this, maybe we can have more sessions. Sure. That's nice. Thank you. I thought it was really good to listen to the, all the information that poured into me it was good actually though i was i'm uh, sorry for too much uh, overload of <laughs> no it, it, I, your um, gestures were very meaningful it was like <laughs> <laughs> actually the the way i was thinking about research was some like it was so small i like i stuck with a thought like okay um we go and find out some data and we present you know that was very simple but the background mein itna bada hai ki, like you, you jitna bol rahe, utna simple nahi hai. so that is one thing like uh, so i have this question like at a master's level like when you do something similar to that like how do you like contextualize because you will be having certain time limit and you have to do the quality of the work and you have to you know fine tune what to do like particularly I was like a little worried. problem choose karu kya how how confident I am in particular things. So if you have what, something what is the what is the area that you want to pursue? Let's take that as an example. So for me, uh, teacher instructional practices. Right. So um, so one of the things is that as I mentioned earlier, as well as that there might be courses that you already have in mm -hmm. this area in your center right uh, mm -hmm. you might have teacher practices i don't know some is there a course which is related to your area of research yeah there is uh, teacher education right so within that itself when you're reading all the texts that are given to you for reading right 
uh, one of the good things about MA programs is that uh, take a reading that really connects with your thoughts, right? And use that reading as a base um, uh, to see where what you can do with that as a research question. So if there is one paper that resonates with you in your master's, see all the different references that are there in that one particular paper. Um, and what helps is then that uh, you might just take one paper uh, and see the references and that becomes your research topic because you can't do much in master's. You have limited time. Uh, you can't, can't do research like a PhD in your master's. Uh, scoping, is very, scoping becomes very important. So we all love the idea of doing research but the best research is which is complete, right? So uh, scoping and also your supervisor, talk to them, how can you scope it, finish it in that particular time. Um, so all of these uh, discussions that we're going to have here are all understandings in terms of how research is done. But when you actually get down to doing research, your supervisor becomes your main sounding board. They are the people who channelize your research a lot of times when you get lost. Um, and you have to sort of keep going back to them again and again for every, every silly question, I would say. Um, so that, uh, you know, it helps you sort of stay true to your timeline um, and also uh, enjoy it as well as find answers to the challenges that you have. We are all going to meet once in a month, but your supervisor is going to be on your head. He's, he or she's like, be your boss that, you know, finish this. So, yeah. Um, I'm not the only one here. There are other students as well. If there's anything else that you want, others want to add to what Lokesh is asking, like, please do. Let's not make it a one-to-one -one connection. Let's make it more. Yeah, I think, yeah. But just that, okay. just that, like, uh, you, you've been giving such valuable information. So I think no one wanted to, like, interrupt like that, so I guess. No, no, no. Let's let that not be the case. I think one of the things about this session is because we are all students and the reason that it becomes informal is because we all are in the position of creating that informality. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, thanks a lot to everyone. Like, it's it's been like three hours since we started and there's still 10 people left. So that speaks a lot about our motivations to be here and other things. So I think, yeah, I mean, uh, if uh, anyone wants to say anything, share. And I'm sure Ekta would yeah, be, yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, you could always reach out to her through email. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think the too. organizers have raised their hands. They need some rest. So yes, <laughs> for sure, it's been a while. But thank you. Thank you, everyone.